Today, I'm going to do a very basic introduction to operating systems and loaders. And we'll see how your program goes from source code into a running process on your computer. Computing infrastructure uses this layered design. At the bottom of, of this infrastructure is the hardware itself. This is your motherboard, your ethernet cards, your Wi-Fi cards. And between the software on your machine and the hardware is the firmware layer. And firmware is essentially hard-coded software. Uh, and the firmware is what gets run initially when you power on your machine. In the old days of the PC, the BIOS, this was the BIOS. Uh, nowadays we have UEFI, and I'll, I'll go talk a little bit more about the differences between those. And they're basically just programs on some read-only memory or some EE prom on your motherboard that is the first thing that the hardware runs when the hardware is turned on. The next layer up is the operating system kernel. And the kernel defines a set of functions in a well-defined interface that your application software can use. And this interface abstracts away differences in the hardware. So whether you've got eight gigs of RAM or 512 megs of RAM, the kernel abstracts away these differences, whether you're using a different processor, an ARM processor, an x86 processor, the operating system kernel makes these kinds of distinctions in hardware largely invisible to application software. In addition, it manages those resources. It manages the RAM and processor access so that you as the application developer cannot directly touch the physical RAM on your machine. You have to go through operating system kernel API calls. And then in the next layer, we have the system software, the topic of this course. And this includes your libraries, the command line shell, compilers, linkers, loaders, all of the software that programmers and uh, system users and administrators need in order to operate and run software on their machine. And then at the top layer, we have the applications. These are your browser, uh, your games, your application software. The application software depends on all of the layers below it. Let's look a little more at the operating system kernel. So as I mentioned, it abstracts away any differences in hardware. So as an analogy, let's look at cars. So nowadays we have all electric cars uh, with no internal combustion engine, and we also have the uh, internal combustion engine cars, the, the cars that we had, we've had for decades. Now, even though the underlying technology powering the motion of these cars, even though that technology is different, the user interface is practically identical. If you have experience driving an internal combustion car, you can easily transition to using an electric car because the interface is the same. You have a steering wheel, you have pedals, you have a stick to change gears. Uh, and so this interface in the car, steering wheels and pedals, that's the user interface. And just like in all engineering and computer science, the user interface abstracts away the details of how this interface is implemented. Instead, you have this new machine model that the user can, can work with without having to actually understand all the details of the underlying technology. An example from the computing world is persistent storage. So there's many, many ways to store files to hardware. We have USB flash drives, we have solid state drives, spinning hard disks, and the operating system kernel has drivers that support all of this different kind of hardware because the, the actual hardware interfaces to these devices are, uh, are different. There's different hardware standards listed here, USB, SATA, EIEDE, these are all different hardware standards. But the operating system kernel not only abstracts away these differences, but provides the user a file system interface. And no matter what hardware is backing the persistent storage, the programmer and the user has the same interface. So the standard POSIX standard uh, 
um, interface for files is open, read, write, seek. Uh, these interfaces are the same no matter what type of storage technology you're using. Because the operating system kernel has infrastructure to hide all of the details of that, of that uh, hardware. Now, in addition to abstracting away hardware differences, the kernel also manages access to resources. And the two main ways that it does this is virtual memory. Uh, so applications, as mentioned before, the applications cannot directly access the physical RAM on your machine. Instead, they make a request through a system call, this API that the kernel defines through a system call, uh, to request access to use more RAM. And the kernel, uh, standard kernels, invisibly uh, manage the data that's stored in RAM by moving it to and from physical storage. And so virtual memory provides this idealized view of a, an enormous uh, amount of memory that the program can access, and under the hood, the kernel manages when this memory is actually backed using physical RAM. It also manages access to the processor. So most of us have uh, laptops or desktops that have a single processor. You know, maybe it has multiple cores, um, but even then it's a finite number of cores, maybe four. But you can still run dozens or hundreds of, of concurrent programs on your machine. And if you're using a windowing interface or any kind of interactive interface, the computer gives you the illusion that these programs are running at the same time. But, of course, with a single processor, the computer is not literally running 100 programs at the exact same time. So what the kernel does is it schedules these programs to share access to the processor, and it switches between them so quickly, you know, in a fraction of a second, that it gives us the illusion that multiple programs are running at the same time. And this is another service that the kernel provides. Whenever you want to execute a program, uh, you know, load it into RAM and jump into the main function. Uh, instead, you tell the kernel what program you want to run, and it will load it and schedule it to get time to use the processor. This is a map of all of the subsystems and layers of interfaces that the Linux kernel has within its software infrastructure. So at the very bottom, we have the connection to the physical hardware, and at the very top, we have the system calls that user space applications can use to interact with the hardware. And you can notice here that even within the kernel, there are several layers within the kernel that create uh, more and more abstract interfaces to the hardware. Additionally, the kernel provides several subsystems. So in addition to managing memory, here we have in light green, and, and the processor in processing, we've also got the human interfaces like uh, monitors and keyboards, mice, touchpads, we have storage, which is persistent storage, that's your file system, and also networking, communicating with across Wi-Fi or Ethernet to communicate with other machines across the internet or, or a LAN. So I've used this term operating system kernel, and that's to kind of skirt a definitional issue. And that's the question of what the operating system is. So depending on who you ask, the operating system might be just the kernel, like just the Linux kernel is the operating system. Depending on others, it's the kernel plus the system software because the kernel alone will not allow you to develop and create new software very easily. You need a lot of tooling to do that. Maybe the windowing interface is also part of the operating system. And looking completely holistically, all of the software on a machine including browser, games, maybe that's the operating system. So this kind of begs the question, what is the line between the operating system itself and applications, just user, user software that is not really necessary for the operation of the machine, um, but depends on the operating system in order to run? And a couple decades ago, this question about what the definition of an operating system is uh, came into the forefront of mainstream news because of a economic battle between Netscape and Microsoft. Uh, 
So Netscape, they were one of the first widespread commercial internet browsers. And they had a very, very large market share. And Netscape ran on Windows, the Windows operating system. So Microsoft, who had been trying to get into the internet game, started bundling their own browser called Internet Explorer with every installation of Microsoft. And this opened up a legal battle between Netscape and Microsoft, and also an antitrust suit by the US federal government against Microsoft. So there were two opposing claims here. One is that Microsoft is using its monopoly power to undermine competition. So how could Microsoft have a monopoly? Well, at the time, PC manufacturers had an agreement with Microsoft to ship their operating system with their new PCs. Now, at the time, unless you wanted to go out and build your own PC, buy your own parts and assemble it, it was pretty tough to be able to find a PC that did not have Microsoft Windows on it. Uh, and that meant you were actually paying the license. Even if it was included in the price of the PC, you were actually paying the license of Microsoft. And it was uh, unusual to be able to get a PC already made without having Microsoft on it. And so Netscape and the federal government considered this um, to be undermining the, the free market. And so by Microsoft putting a competing product on every PC without consumer choice, this was considered using its monopoly power. Now, Microsoft's counterclaim, they, they weren't making any claims about monopoly power or their shrewd business practices. Their main defense was that the Internet Explorer was not an application. It was not a user application. It was an integral part of the operating system. As integral, as you'll, you can see in a speech by, by uh, Bill Gates on the matter, as integral as memory management and, and other system software and kernel level features of an operating system. Uh, so you can check out this YouTube video. It's a pretty interesting argument as to what makes where the line between operating system is or is not. I believe Microsoft lost partially lost their case. Um, but as you can see today, eventually Internet Explorer got the major uh, majority of the market share and Netscape went out of business. Uh, Netscape's source code was eventually used to kick off the open source Mozilla Firefox project. So if we take some broader view of the operating system as being more than the kernel, then what is the kernel versus the operating system? So it's very easy to look at the command line interface and say, well, that's, that's Linux. And to be pedantic, this is not exactly true uh, because the command line interface is really just another piece of software. Uh, the common one that I use is called Bash, but there, there are many other command line shells. But the command line is really just a user space application. It relies on the kernel, uh, but it itself is not the kernel, it's not the Linux kernel. And if you look at the Linux code base, it only contains the kernel, that map I showed you a couple slides ago. So there's no command line tools in the kernel. The Linux kernel at least has no windowing interface. The Linux kernel code contains no compiler, linker loaders, libraries, none of what you need to actually operate and write software for your computer. For a typical Linux operating system distribution, these system software tools actually come from a different organization called GNU. Now GNU is a recursive acronym that stands for GNU's not Unix. The G stands for GNU, which of course expands to GNU's not Unix and, and ad infinitum. Now the history of this organization is that in 1983, Richard Stallman, a free software advocate, announces his project is going to start. And it was intended to be a free and complete Unix-like operating system. And that was because Unix, which was developed in the you know, late 60s and 70s at AT&T, was actually a proprietary commercial operating system sold and owned and trademarked by AT&T. Uh, but 
Richard Stallman and other free software advocates wanted, be, believed that users should have access to their source code and be free to tinker and modify their software without any legal ramifications. And so he set out to develop his own completely open source and free to use and free to modify operating system with all kernel and system software tools and some applications available for anyone to use. Now, 1984 development begins uh, largely with Richard Stallman putting a lot of effort in. Over time, more uh, developers joined his cause. And in 1985, he wrote the GNU Manifesto and created the Free Software Foundation in order to uh, organize and fund the work that he was working on. So he has this concept of FLOSS, free Libra open source software. And this freedom is freedom as in speech, like as in rights, not freedom as in this is free beer or free lunch. And so these concepts of, of free software and open source software were codified in 1989's GNU public license or the GPL. And this was different than a lot of other open source licenses in that it not only allowed anyone to download and use software, even for commercial purposes, but it required that anyone who made modifications to that software and used it for commercial purposes had to release the software, the software and their modifications. So unlike other open source licenses like the MIT license or BSD, which are a lot more liberal in how you can use the software, the GPL not only lets you use software for free and modify it at will, it actually requires you to keep the software open source if you use it and if you, if you release it. In 1990, the Free Software Foundation started working on the kernel for this operating system. So initially, all of the system software, all of the tooling that you need to write software, like compilers, linkers, loaders, command line utilities, these were largely done, but the kernel, the part that actually you need in order to use all this software, was not quite done. Work on this GNU herd, this kernel, was taking a long time, and at the time, this guy, Linus Torvalds, announced that he wanted to create a, his own kernel, and he called it Linux. It was a tiny project, 50,000 lines of code, and he decided to license it under the GPL, under the GNU public license. And he used all of the tooling from GNU, all of the compilers and command line tools. Really was just a toy project for him at the time. Um, but a lot of developers eventually started joining in and it grew into you know this huge project that it is today uh, and by licensing it on to, under the uh, gpl it made linux be able to be spread uh, as open source software and used by you know anybody in the world in 1992 in the very early stages of linux professor tannenbaum actually said linux is op obsolete and this has to do with this microkernel versus monolithic kernel debate. Uh, if you take an operating system courses, uh, hopefully they will talk to you about microkernel versus monolithic. Uh, it's really a um, difference in how the kernel should be designed. So in that, that system map, that map of all of the subsystems and layers of the kernel, uh, microkernel advocates have a different view about how that layering should happen in relation to the hardware. So in 1993 and on, we already started seeing distributions of a complete operating system, Slackware, Debian, Red Hat, and this bundled not only the Linux kernel, but it bundled all of the GNU tooling you would need to operate a complete, to operate your computer with a complete operating system. And a couple of interesting um, events in the history of Linux is in 2003, this company SEO sued these Linux distributions claiming that they had rights over the Unix trademark and actually the source code of Linux. And that was because um, the Unix operating system as it uh, became less and less relevant in the computing world, AT&T sold the rights to Unix, sold the source code, sold the trademark. And this company, SEO, 
use that trademark to start suing these distributors. They did eventually lose this lawsuit. Fortunately, because now we have Linux today, free and open for everybody to use. 2007, another big push for, for Linux, Android, the Google Android project, announced that their operating system would use the Linux kernel under the hood. Now, interestingly, Android uses much less of the GNU tools. They have their own tooling and, and interfaces on top of, of Linux, but they still use the Linux kernel underneath the hood. 2011, we see Linux 3.0, and by this year, Linux is hundreds in hundreds of millions of devices. It's over 10 million lines of code. So to see how Linux fits into the larger space of free and open source software and, and the GNU operating system software, down in the right bottom corner, you have the Linux kernel. And all of this infrastructure around it is the rest of the open source world. So at the foundation of this, this an open source operating system, you have the kernel, you have the C library, you have a bunch of system tools for doing user administration, managing your storage devices, administering your networks. And as we go up this graph, we get closer to the application software, like browsers and file explorers, games, email clients. And so the free and open source software world today has an enormous amount of software, that so much so that you can practically only use open source software if you so choose. Now this distinction between a kernel and an operating system and Linux and the GNU suite of tools resulted in another controversy initiated largely by Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation. So it was true that Linux had filled this gap in GNU's uh, picture of a free and open source operating system. But the kernel, even today, is still rarely used. GNU's version of the Unix-like uh, Unix kernel, GNU Herd, is still rarely used. Um, but on the other hand, most Linux-based operating systems use the GNU system software. One of the exceptions to this is Android. There are some other Internet of Things devices and routers that, that don't use GNU software. But by and large, most Linux installations use GNU system software. And so Richard Stallman insisted that Linux, just calling the operating system Linux, was incorrect, and it should be called GNU Linux. And Linus Torvalds even kind of agreed with this a little bit in 1992. He said most of the tools used with Linux are GNU software or under GNU copyleft. Stallman made the point that millions of people are using an operating system was developed so they can have freedom, but they don't know this because they think it's Linux and that was just developed by a student, you know, Linus Torvalds. Um, but there is also arguments on the other side that it should just be called Linux. So, uh, uh, Raymond, who's a popular writer in the free and open source software world, says this claim is a proxy for an underlying territorial dispute. People who insist on using the term GNU Linux want the Free Software Foundation to get most of the credit for Linux because Stallman and friends wrote many of its user level tools. And Torvalds, later in 2001, said, well, I think it's justified. But it's justified if you actually make a GNU distribution of, of Linux, because if you actually make your own distribution of Linux, you get to name the thing, but calling Linux in general GNU Linux, I think, is just ridiculous. So it's up to you to make up your mind, but just another That's due to event. this difficulty of defining the line between kernel and operating system. So that's a very, very basic overview of operating systems. There's an operating system course here. I highly recommend taking it or studying on your own pick up an op uh, operating systems textbook or learn a little bit more about the Unix operating system, Linux operating system. So now let's look at how your program actually gets executed. The first thing that the computer needs to do is boot. And booting is the series of steps that goes from a machine that's off to launching the operating system and being able to run the very first program and eventually your software on a machine. So the word booting comes from this, this expression, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. 
as far as I understand, that is the, uh, that's the origin of this term. So the very first programs that run on your machine is firmware that's stored on a motherboard ROM chip. So as I said before, in the olden days, this was the BIOS. Nowadays, it's Intel's UEFI. And so in the case of the BIOS, it then just loads and runs the first 512 bytes of your hard disk, whatever your, your master hard disk is on your motherboard, this just gets run. <clears throat> UEFI is almost like a mini operating system uh, built into your hardware. Has its own device drivers, uh, and it is a lot more flexible in how it can start uh, booting the operating system. So when UEFI starts up, uh, it runs the bootloader program. The bootloader program is a special program that initializes and runs the operating system kernel, and then the kernel kicks off its initial process. And this creates a whole cascade of, of operations that uh, launch your operating system. Here's a diagram of all of these steps in the boot process. Uh, and this is specific to a PC that ha uh, has BIOS uh, and this bootloader tool called Grub. So when you power on your machine, the BIOS gets executed and it uh, runs the first step of the bootloader that's stored in the first 512 bytes of your hard drive. That's called the master boot record, the MBR. If this fails, then your BIOS will give you that horrible message that says missing operating system. Because this master boot record is only 512 bytes, uh, it's used to kick off yet another bootloader programmer, program, the stage two of the scrub bootloader, which then reads some configuration files to uh, present the user with a menu on, on what operating system they want to boot up. If you have a dual boot um, setup, then this will present you Windows and Linux or whatever you have dual boot setup. Uh, once you select what system you want to boot, Grub will then do the work of initializing the kernel, mount the root file system, run the initial process of the kernel, the first process that ever gets run called a NIT um, in the old days. Nowadays, systemd is used. And then a NIT has a series of configuration scripts to start all of the services and everything and the, the the desktop system and everything that's needed for the, the user to use the operating system. Now, in order to run our software on this machine, we need the loader. And the loader is a tool that asks the operating system to take a program, a program on disk, and actually get it running as a process on, uh, in memory. And there are several pieces of system software that need to work together in order to get this to happen. So the compiler needs to produce a binary program in the right format. In Linux, this is the ELF format. Uh, and it also needs to um, use the C runtime library in order to set up the uh, execution environment and actually call into the main function. Then the operating system has a family of system calls called the exec, you know, exec VE or some, they're, they, they're all exec with some suffix on them. And all of these generally read the program binary from storage, read the program's ELF layout, this format that is used to store programs, and loads or copies this binary into RAM. And then it does a branch and jumps to the underscore start function. And that's where the C runtime library does its setup and calls your, your main function. So if you want to see more details, a very detailed discussion of this process in Linux, there's a link here. So here's just a little uh, diagram of the relationship between the different subsystems and the operating system. So when you uh, when your compiler finishes producing your program binary, it will save it to disk, and that save goes through the write function, uh, which tells the kernel to actually store these bytes onto disk or whatever, whatever persistent storage you have. So in step one, our program binary is stored on your hard drive or your solid state drive. 
then when you call dot slash program, you actually execute your program, the, if you're using bash, the bash shell will actually call the exec function. The exec function will work with the file system to take that program off disk. It'll work with the virtual memory to set up the address space for that uh, uh, program. And it'll wrap this program in a new structure called a process. And a process keeps information about the program, like how long it's been running, what its priority for running is, uh, where its memory is mapped into physical memory. And the scheduler part of the operating system will periodically uh, allow this process to run. So right now I'll show you a demo of what this program binary looks like using a tool called Object Dump. And we'll look at how we can actually disassemble the program binary back into assembly. We can look at its symbol table and we look at how uh, linking relates to this, uh, this whole process. Let's take a look at these compiled object files. I'm inside of the make directory, inside of the syllabus projects directory. If you're using the virtual machine, this is gonna be under vagrant slash make. So in here I have a couple of C files, function.c and main.c, and a header file. The C file just contains, main.c just contains a single main function, and it prints something out, and then it calls the function f, returns zero. And inside of function.c, I have the definition of the function f. So main runs, it prints out, prints something out, calls f, f prints something out, and then it's done. To see this program run, we can run make, and that gives us the function simple c. When I run simple c, I see the contents of main being printed out and the printf from f being printed out. Okay, so let's run make clean to remove all this and get us back to our original state. Okay, so to compile, a single C file into an object file, we use the dash C, we use the dash C argument. So what this gives us is it gives us main.o. Now main.o is not yet a program. It's just an object file that contains the compiled main.c file. Remember, main.c does not contain all the code that we need. It calls this function f, and f is defined in a different c file. So we can use object dump to spit out the contents of main.o. So this is all the code that we have inside of main.o. And don't worry too much about the assembly. This is just assembly code. And you can see here that that's the, uh, that's the uh, main function. This is the disassembly of the main function. And disassembly just takes the, the binary uh, machine code and, and puts it back into assembly language. Now, in order to be able to use functions from other C files, each one of these object files has a symbol table that says what variables and what uh, functions are either used or defined inside of this object file. So you can see here that main is defined at this offset. Uh, and it uses the function printf and it uses the function f. And you can see the symbol table says that both of these functions are undefined. So if we compile our function file, similarly, we get a, an undefined usage of printf uh, and the function f is defined by f, by function.c.
And now given these two object files, it's the linker's job, which we will call using Clang again. Under the hood, Clang will be using the linker. It's the linker's job to take these two .o files and match up the used functions that are undefined and the defined functions. So now when I compile this into a single program called simple, probably should have been simple C. When I compile this into a single program called simple C and I dump the table of simple C, there's a lot more content here because there's a bunch of standard library and C runtime stuff. But you notice that here, F is defined and main is defined. Moreover, uh, so printf is not defined. There are still some undefined functions here, and that'll be handled at load time uh, through a dynamic linker. So we're not going to get too much into linking and loading, but there's a special uh, functionality in, in most operating systems that you don't have to statically link all of the code. Uh, the operating system will go out and find that code for you at runtime. So when we run this program, uh, it does exactly what we want it to do. It, it calls the main function and then it calls f, uh, goes back to main and returns and ends. That's just a little overview of, of what these object files look like. So now let's take a look at uh, an important set of system software that any good software engineer should be comfortable with. This is build automation. So build automation is an essential tool when doing software development, especially as you're building larger and larger tools. So to get a sense of what build automation gives you, I'm sure all of you have used the C compiler. You've all used GCC to compile your program source code into a program binary and you can run your program. Uh, the problem is if you have a very, very large piece of software with many C files, it can be very tedious to run this process by hand. Uh, it's also not necessarily very repeatable. And as you get larger and larger programs, you've got many, many C files and many, many calls to the compiler and many calls to the linker. So build automation gives you a repeatable and programmable build process. The build automation tool that we're going to be using for our project is Make. So Make, I'm making Make mandatory for your project. Make has been around for decades. Uh, it's still widely used, at least for C system software. And what it gives you is incremental compilation. It rebuilds software only as needed. So let's look at an example Make file. And this is a Make file that you can actually use for your project. I've actually put this into the projects directory and we'll, we'll go over an example of using it uh, in a second. Uh, you don't have to know, be an expert on make. It has pretty esoteric syntax. It's not particularly intuitive to use. It is a pretty old language, um, but it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. At the top here, we have variables. So the SRC and object variables. These just define all of the .c files in your current directory. So this star.c will automatically just fill this with how, whatever .c files you have in your directory. And obj replaces the extension c with .o. So now we have a list of all the .c files, and we have a list of all the dot corresponding .o files. And prog is just the name of our final program. Uh, so it's also mandatory to name your compiler simple c so that we can easily automatically grade it. So phony is just a uh, minor detail about make files. Don't worry about this too much. It's basically saying that all and clean are not actually files. Uh, and then the rest of the file is build rules. And build rules say, in order to generate the target, which is the string on the left, this depends on the source, which is the which are the files to the right of the colon. And whenever we need to rebuild this target or build it for the first time, we should execute all of the commands underneath the target and source. So this potentially confusing build rule here says build, to build whatever is in the prog variable, so to build simple C, we need 
to depend on whatever is in the object variable, which is all the .o files. And in order to build simple C, we call the C compiler uh, on all of these object files. So this just says CC is a variable that holds the name of the C compiler, dash O defines the output file, money sign ampersand is the name of the target, in this case simple C, and money sign caret is the list of all the object files, the source files. So these are special variables that have very unintuitive syntax, but special variables in make that refer to the target and source. Uh, another idiosyncrasy of make files is that the commands must be indented with a tab. You cannot use spaces, otherwise the make file won't work. It has to be a tab character. Uh, and then the rest of the, the build rules, the next build rule, money, uh, percent sign dot O, this is saying to build any dot O file. It depends on the dot C file, and we call the C compiler in order to build this. And every build automation, every good build automation, whether it's a make file or some other build process, should have a way to remove all of the stuff that was generated, all the binaries, all the documentation, all the intermediate files. And so by convention, that is a clean target. So in this case, the clean target just removes the program and any object files that were created. So let's, uh, let me show you a demo of, of using make. Okay, so let's go back to the example we uh, saw a little bit ago when looking at object dump. So again, this is in the syllabus under projects and the, under the make directory. If you're using the virtual machine, this is under slash vagrant slash make. So in here, we've got our two C files, function.c and main.c, and we have our make file. So the make file is uh, just what we saw in the slides. And you can just copy this make file into your, into your uh, repository. And it will take any .c files you have in that directory and compile it into the simple C program. So that when we grade and when you test your program, all you have to do is type make and it will automatically compile and link everything into the simple C program. And so now you can run it using dot slash simple C. Now what's nice about make is if we modify one of these files. So if I edit main and I add another print file, another print statement. So I just added another print statement. If I run make, Notice that only main.c is rebuilt. It doesn't bother rebuilding function.c because nothing changed. Now I can run simple c. And so similarly, if only the .o file changed, I can say touch to change its modification date without actually editing the file. You'll see that the make file will only relink the .o files. Now, normally you wouldn't have a .o file changing by itself, but just to show uh, Make's ability to do incremental builds, only build, rebuild that part of your program that actually had changes. Uh, and so in, because due to the compilation, we've got these two .o files, function.o and main.o. And we also have our program, simple c. These were all created by Make, and that clean target, if I say make clean, that will remove all the .o files and remove the program simple.c, restoring us to our uh, original state. This uh, tilde file was just created by my editor. It's a backup from the uh, editor. Okay, and that's uh, the basics of make. So use make for your project. You can just copy this make file and use it unmodified. Feel free to play around with it if you want to organize your source code directory uh, in a more fancy way. But as long as all your .c files are in the same directory and the root directory of your repository and your make file is there, you can just run make and you will now have your simple C uh, program. Your compiler will be emitting LLVM IR. So LLVM 
is the low-level virtual machine. And it was started by this researcher named Chris Latner while he was a master's student. And it's an open source compiler framework. It has hundreds and hundreds of contributors. Latner was now hired by Apple. Uh, so there's many languages that now use LLVM, including Apple's new Swift language. And what, it, what LLVM does, uh, well, one of the things that it does is it defines a, an intermediate representation. And the intermediate representation is like a high-level assembly language. It has function definitions, has types, has unlimited registers. But other than that, it looks very much like assembly language. And what it does is it abstracts away details of different assembly languages, while at the same time being independent of any particular source language. So having this intermediate representation makes writing new compilers much easier. So instead of having to write a compiler that for C that targets x86 and then writing a new compiler for C that targets ARM. We can write one C compiler that targets LLVM and we get all of the existing machine code generation for free. Uh, so this concept of a compiler separates the compiler into the front end into the back end. The front end processes the source language, it processes C and generates intermediate representation. The back end takes that intermediate representation and generates machine code. So here in this diagram, we have LLVM in the middle, and its mascot and logo is this dragon, uh, presumably because of the Dragon Book, which is a recommended book for this course. And we see on the, on the left, we have all the different language front ends. And on the right, we have all the different machine code back ends. Now notice, we, you know, just in this diagram alone, we've got five different source code languages, C++, C, Objective-C, Python. And in the back end, we have five different machine code architectures. So without LLVM, each compiler would have to process both the source language and produce the machine code language. So with five different source languages and five different architectures, that would be 25 unique compilers. But with LLVM in the middle, we only need to write five different front ends, one for each language, and five different code generation. Pieces of code generation, that's only you know, 10 different pieces that we, have to, that we have to generate. And with LLVM, there's a lot of common work uh, for analysis of, of code, optimization, um, that does not have to be repeated for every compiler. We can just reuse that as a compiler writer. So for our project, we're gonna be writing a new front end for LLVM, and we get all the machine code generation for free by using LLVM. So let's take a look at an example program that's written in LLVM's intermediate representation. Now, as I mentioned before, the LLVM provides you function definitions and function calls, it provides you variables. Uh, these variables are in static single assignment form, or SSA, uh, and at the simplest, this just means variables can only be assigned once. And then it gives us uh, a whole bunch of assembly-like operations or instructions. So at the bottom, we have an example of an LLVM IR program. Now, you'll only need to know a pretty limited amount of LLVM, uh, but it's good to be familiar with the overall structure of an LLVM IR file. So in the first line, we've got a global variable. This at sign means a global variable. And it's all of this text here is, is just defining the hello world string. Uh, and the next, we have the main function. Uh, and it's defined to be a function that returns a 32-bit integer. That's what the i32-bit means. And then on the first line of main, we are allocating space for a variable. Then we are storing a value in that variable. And then the next line, we've got a call to the printf function. So don't worry so much about all the details of the syntax, but just be aware that this is a function call to printf. So the first part of the call is defining the type of that printf call. So a printf takes, uh, so the printf returns a 32-bit number usually you're, you know, I think most of you probably don't actually save that return value, but printf does indeed return uh, 
a 32-bit number. And then it takes a pointer to a character, which is what? Pointer to a character uh, is a string. It's the beginning of a string. And then it takes a, a variable number of arguments after that. And then in the actual call, we're passing, you know, the main things to notice is that we're passing the, uh, the global string uh, variable to it that holds hello world. And at the very bottom of the source code, we have a declaration of the printf function. So you won't have to generate complete programs. I've given you a template of an LLVM program that you can use to just fill in the instructions that you generate with your compiler. The way we get to machine code from LLVM IR is we just use LLVM or its front end called Clang. And LLVM IR will compile into machine code. And we can use Clang, the C front end for LLVM to, to do so. Uh, the reason this is convenient is because printf, printf is a library function. It's not defined anywhere in your program. So we need to uh, use linking in order to have access to that printf function. And Clang handles all this for you. So the way we do this is we just, just like with GCC, we, we write Clang, we use dash O to give the program name, and then we write whatever source file we want to compile. And in this case, we use hello world.ll, and then we run it as usual. Now your compiler is going to output LLVM IR and then we'll use Clang in order to generate the machine code and run your program in order to grade it. So let me show you an example of compiling and running this LLVM IR code, but just keep in your mind the distinction between compiling from the source language, which is simple C in your case, to LLVM IR, versus compiling LLVM IR itself to machine code, which is already given to us by using Clang and LLVM. Okay, so let's take a look at actually uh, compiling and running an LLVM IR function uh, by turning it into machine code using LLVM. So let's go into the examples directory where I've got a number of uh, example LLVM IR files here. And so just remember that your compiler is going to be generating .ll files. It's going to be actually generating uh, code in the LLVM IR. And then again, we can use Clang to turn these LLVM files into machine code that can be executed. So if I take hello world.ll, uh, so, well, let's take a look at hello world.ll. Hello world.ll is um, basically the same as what I showed you in slides. This is the main function. There's a lot of other decorations and, and metadata here, but the main, main part is this main function that just calls printf using the hello world string. And to compile it, we can just use clang. So use clang dash o, just like GCC, clang dash o, hello world's the name of my program. And the source file that I wanna compile is hello world.ll. So when I do this, I've now got my hello world program. And when I run it, voila, I've got hello world. So all.ll, this is uh, an example that corresponds to a simple C program in Project Zero tests. So when, once you start working on the project, there's a test file that has some of your test cases. And this is pretty much what your program should output for, for uh, that example program, for that simple C program. Uh, so we can see here that it's, it's doing a bunch of math computation, which I'll, I'll talk about in the next lecture. But if we compile this, we, again, we use Clang. I'll just call it the all program. And when I run it, I get a bunch of numbers being printed out. And there's more example. There's another example in here, a template example, and I'll let you uh, play with these. And this will help you do homework one. Uh, which is just taking the LLVM IR given in the homework, making it into a file, compiling it to machine code the way I showed you here, and then just writing the output as your answer. In conclusion, we looked at a little bit of basic operating systems, how they're organized. We looked at linking and loading, how to use make files, and how to compile and run LLVM IR.
Next time we'll go over your compiler project and get started on what you need to know for completing project zero.